everyone, welcome to Foresight's Neotech Group. I'm really happy to be joined here by Bradley Love. And I came across recently on the internet, obviously through recommendations across the brain GPT and then across all the other incredible work that you're doing. And I think it's incredibly relevant for what many of the people in this group are hoping to aspire to do and combines many of the fields that Foresight is really interested in. So I'm really excited to have you present on what you're currently working on. And then maybe in the Q&A, we can also get a little bit about like future implications and can get talking about that. But first of all, thank you so much for answering to my cold email. And from this point onward, the stage is yours. I'm going to share much more about your academic and your general professional information here in the chat for those people that are interested in diving deep into it. But without further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for coming. It's a true pleasure to have you on. Oh, no, thank you, Alison. I mean, thanks for the kind of introduction and for inviting me. Uh, to motivate the topic of this talk, let me first say something about a very tiny area in the brain called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is important in memory and other cognitive processes. If you go into Google Scholar and type in hippocampus, you'll get over 2 million hits. So obviously no human scientist could read all these papers. And even if one wanted to restrict this just to the last six months, you'd still get over 21,000 research articles to go through, which is just not human readable. Nobody could keep up with the scientific literature. So scientists are always complaining that it just seems like there's more and more to read and keep up with every year. And that actually is true. The scientific literature is growing exponentially at about a rate of 3% increase per year. So it's just, it is actually overwhelming and it's impossible to integrate all this information. And this information deluge has negative consequences for progress in science. So there is some evidence that science is not progressing as rapidly as it could because potentially disruptive findings are being lost in just this flood of information. Okay, so it's even worse than I've indicated really because neuroscientists don't just study one bit of brain, they study interactions across them. So let me just use an example from my own research in computational neuroscience. So yes, yeah, so you look at the campus and how people learn categories from examples, new concepts shown up top here. We also look at how medial prefrontal cortex is important for establishing in that type of learning that the hippocampus supports what's relevant to the learning, sort of like the brain's attentional mechanism. And then we also look at how that feeds down into visual cortex to shape processing there. So even in our own work, we're looking at the interactions of three brain regions. You could just imagine how the amount of information that's relevant to this endeavor just explodes. And it gets worse yet if you want to be interdisciplinary as I try to be. So I try to follow the machine learning literature to incorporate insights from it and tools into my own research. So this challenge of just staying abreast of everything is overwhelming. Um, in the past, and really still now, one strategy I tried to use to make sense of this flood of information is to work with theoretical or computational models, which I almost saw as a kind of like lossy data compression of the literature. For example, I study human learning, and if you have a model of human learning that accounts for a number of empirical findings, in some sense, that model could be a stand-in for this like broader empirical literature. Okay, so it's not a perfect kind of encapsulation of all these empirical papers, but it could help a bit. So that's one strategy. And that's continued with me and with others and incorporating models from machine learning as actually not just tools, but as models of how the brain computes. When there was this flood of excitement starting, I guess, 10 years ago in convolutional networks and object recognition, neuroscientists use them to look compared to how the eventual visual stream in the brain processes visual information. So models can help, but obviously they're not solving the problem because we still have this flood of information that we can't handle. And so what's going on. This is just my opinion that scientists are overwhelmed. They unfortunately can have low engagement with challenging ideas, including theoretical models. There's a lot of chasing of fads or maybe even the opposite problem as well. It's like people getting in their own narrow paradigm or silo where they can actually control the information flood, but they're unlikely to make advances in their silo that are going to impact the broader landscape of the field. And of course, scientists are humans. So we have all these pernicious issues of influence, prestige, and social networks. So somehow the signal is getting swamped out and the noise a bit. And what's the solution here? So in other fields, aspects of the science have been automated. So you might have heard about deep mind work in protein folding and alpha fold, for example, using deep learning. 
likewise has been work in material science and in drug discovery, automating aspects of scientific discovery using deep learning. Maybe the solution for neuroscience is just something like, we'll just use chat GPT or a related model, but probably not by itself. Uh, here's an interaction from Twitter from months ago when these models just came out and people weren't aware of the types of errors they could make. And this mathematician's being asked about a paper he wrote. And the problem is the paper doesn't exist. And the person writes back, thanks for letting me know. I'll stop using chat GPT for finding research papers. Computer scientists refer to these as hallucinations. It's just really the model doing its thing. It's a, a generative model that's integrating everything it's been trained on and it can make samples from it. And samples aren't necessarily going to be facts or reality. It doesn't mean they're not val valuable, but it just underscores that maybe these aren't the right models for retrieving facts, at least alone. But they still could be useful as companions to scientists. And that's what I'm going to push for. So underlying these large language models are transformers, which really improve upon previous generation models like recurrent networks in terms of both their performance, but in the efficiency and training them. They contain these blocks in which there is a self-attention mechanism that we'll talk about. And the real advance there is that it could take in the whole passage of information. Let's look at once, like the whole text passage and figure out the relevance of all the parts to each other instead of going word by word, like more like how people do and how recurrent networks do, where they read basically one word at a time and representation, which just proves to not be as computationally efficient and perform as well. In contrast, those transformer models, again, look at how everything relates to everything at once within an attention block. So in this case, you know, the models figured out that it in the sentence refers to the monkey. Okay. And so there'll be many paths or heads in these models, and there'll be many layers in depth, many blocks of these transformers. And they'll also be followed by your traditional multi-layer perception networks with them in these transformer blocks. So these models are pretty simple architecturally. They're pretty vanilla, but they're very powerful and they scale up to perform well with billions of parameters trained on a huge, for example. ChatGPT probably alone is not the solution, but maybe it could, something like that could be useful for neuroscience if it's put into a kind of teaming solution. It's probably not great to use alone, especially as a retrieval model. Uh, so you might've come across Meta's Galactica model and they got in a bit of trouble. They had to pull it after three days. This was a tool intended for scientists to summarize the literature. And unfortunately it made things up as it sampled from this best kind of knowledge base it had. And it got accused of spreading misinformation. So Meta had to pull it. Where these models excel, I think, is in actually taking all they know and generating novel insights. So something looks like a prediction or a novel output. So here, this is a trivial task of the model just asking you, please write a Python program that counts from four to 33 counting by fives. And the models could easily generate this code, explain how it works and run the code if you ask it to. So if they could do things like this and much more sophisticated things, why can't we train them on basically the entire neuroscience literature and maybe even the future on raw data and gleam insights from them? So this would not be replacing scientists, but using these models as a tool to complement the scientists and address this uh, lack of capacity to integrate these vast literatures that humans just don't have. Um, a critic right now would be like, well, this isn't science alone. And it's not, it's a tool for scientists to do science. And so it might evoke like Borges, like a um, rigor in science where the map makers make a map as big as the earth that is not useful. But that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to actually integrate everything into a tool that people could use to get informative samples from. So it's not solving neuroscience by just sort of making a map of it. So it's going to be more akin to how mathematicians these days solve proofs by working with computer assistants. So it's not really replacing the mathematicians, it's just making them be able to do their job a lot better. Okay, so if we had, say, what's called a brain GPT, it would be tremendously useful to neuroscientists, but they could use it for things like helping design their studies. So, you, well, if I tweak these parameters, how does that affect the method? How does that affect the predictive result? What if I use fMRI instead of MEG to image the brain and conduct power analysis, design optimization. And you could really just look at how measures and populations relate. You could also see like how informative your study would be if you ran it. So 
you might think that the field's got something systematically wrong. And you could confirm that by running it on brain CPT to see what the field's consensus is from a published literature and be like, aha, I guess they predict the opposite of me, but I have this valid reason why I think I'll be right. That would make it even more impressive if you ran your study and it pr you proved to be correct. So that would show that your results are very informative. Whereas if the brain GPT predicted with 99% certainty you were going to observe what you predicted to observe, maybe that's a study that doesn't need to be run. On the other hand, of course, you could use a system like this to detect outlier studies, either because they're transformative or because maybe they contain errors in them. Um, as a computational modeler that makes models of how people learn and make decisions, I would find the ability to do infinite meta-analyses really valuable with such a system. So rather than just comparing my model or fitting it to one specific data set, I could compare it to the field's general understanding of the phenomena. And of course, just to make sure this isn't all made up, uh, we could test on held out studies. So studies that brain GPT hasn't been exposed to, we could put in, here's what we're going to do, what's going to happen, and they'll be able to either get it correct or not. And I'll discuss later some benchmark work we're doing now that gets at this when it's an objectively correct answer. So we could really know if these models are making sense of the neuroscience literature. Okay, so there have been previous efforts with related vision. It just didn't have the advances in large language modeling at the time to really rise to the full challenge. For example, Maristin worked with one particular kind of data, required a lot of kind of human annotation, and it was really about matching keywords with patterns of brain activity. So it wasn't, this wasn't there yet in terms of large language modeling. Okay. So I think a skeptic right now would be like, well, this is a great idea, but how are you ever going to do this, especially in some kind of open source, academic or quasi-academic setting? How would this ever be possible when GPT-4 has estimated the cost of $100 million to train and TikTok is spending a billion on GPUs for AI alone? How, how are you going to do this? Well, luckily, there's been some enabling advances in the last few years that make this sort of project usable. So you might have seen this week's memo from Google, we have no mode and neither does open AI. And the gist of it basically is that open source efforts or smaller groups, including academic groups, could quite rapidly close the gap with corporate behemoths and, and general large language model abilities that even surpass them in niche domains, like say neuroscience. And there's a lot of technologies and changes in the landscape that have made this possible. One of them is that large organizations are openly releasing base or foundational models such as Meta's Llama model or Falcon. And so these models, the, these organizations have spent the millions training them. And they've made them freely available, not just to use, but to download all their weight and see what they were trained on. So that makes it possible for others to expand on their efforts and improve these models. So one example of that, taking a Llama open source based model from Meta and extending it is this Vicuna project where they did what's called fine tuning, where they downloaded all the llama weights and basically just trained on some additional data and tweaked all the weights just a little bit, uh, which isn't, it's difficult, but not too costly. They estimated it cost them around $300 to do this, which is a lot less than hundred million. And they got a nice big jump in performance from this fine tuning. There's also been other insights and advances that favor going small approaches. But for a while, maybe since the DeepMind Chinchilla paper, it's been known that there's these scaling laws for large language models in terms of model size, bigger is better, and training set size, bigger is better. But it looks like there's also this other axis emerging of data quality, training data quality. For example, in this paper, they focused on niche domain of programming, and they're able to get a very high performing system without using millions of dollars of compute and huge training sets by just having high quality data and focusing on their one domain. Likewise, there's bootstrapping approaches that are beginning to take hold where you take the larger model like GPT-4, the large language model that costs millions, and you use it actually to get very informative samples to train a new model from scratch but smaller. And so this could be done in a way that's computationally feasible. So basically it's a way to distill some of the knowledge from this huge model and incorporate it into this smaller model that could be specialized as well at a reduced cost. 
So what we're using that I want to say a little bit about is I have some pilot results using this for neuroscience domain is this LoRa approach, which is becoming very popular, which stands for low rank adoption of large language models. And the idea here is if you have one of these large models based or foundational models for free, like Llama, and you could download it, and that would be like this blue box here. This would be like a large matrix in that model. There's many matrices in the model. Instead of tuning these weights and changing them, which actually can be difficult, what you do is you freeze them and you just train these a few new weights to run in parallel. And that's where you can incorporate your new knowledge, say more in-depth knowledge of neuroscience literature. And the trick here is that you don't have to train that many weights for this orange pathway because the rank or the intrinsic dimensionality, if you want to think of it that way, of this blue matrix isn't as large as the number of weights implied. And we could get at why that might be in the discussion, if you like. But the fact lets you do this trick of instead of training of tons of weights in this orange pathway, you could just decompose it into two smaller matrices. For example, instead of having a thousand by thousand matrix to be much bigger in real life, which is a million weights, you could have two matrices to train in that orange pathway. You have thousand rows by 10 columns, and then another matrix of 10 rows and a thousand columns. And so if you multiply those together, you'll get back to the original extrinsic dimensionality of a thousand by thousand, but you only need 20,000 weights, which is a lot less than a million. It's only 2% as much. So using this technique, you could have huge savings in training and storage, and it really makes it possible to you do some smart fine tuning of these models to incorporate new knowledge. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're basically going to take Llama. There's already Llama 2, but when we just did this, there was just Llama and train a little bit of neuroscience knowledge along that orange pathway cheaply, actually just on one GPU in lab. And this is just really pilot results to see if this is plausible at all. We trained on a minuscule amount of data, like less than 7,000 cognitive neuroscience abstracts. Cognitive neuroscience is a sub area in neuroscience. And really all we wanted to see is if we could get the perplexity, like basically get the model to orient itself more towards the neuroscience literature to show that it would be possible to get any kind of understanding of neuroscience with more and more training. And so on the right here, this is sort of the improvement in perplexity and sort of the, how the model is oriented towards neuroscience. And the first bar here is cognitive neuroscience, which these are held out test cases from the same training domain and see an improvement. But you also see an improvement in physics and chemistry and a very closely related field, cognitive psychology, which is basically just cognitive neuroscience with an emphasis on behavior instead of brain measures. A little bit of training is that the model learned basically a template for scientific abstracts where it has sort of the problem, the method, the results, and the implications. But there's some encouraging signs here because you can see these outlier test cases where there's a big improvement for cognitive neuroscience and the closely related field of cognitive psychology, but you don't see that for physics and chemistry. And I think what's going on there is that by chance, some of the training items had some kind of topic overlap with the test items, such that we got this big facilitation. So what I'm thinking is we did, as we would plan to do like more than a thousand times more training than this, we just cover everything pretty much in the target domain of cognitive neuroscience and somewhat cover things in related domains like cognitive psychology. And that would basically let the model show some understanding of, of neuroscience. So this is encouraging just as a quick experiment with this LoRa fine tuning. So at this point we thought, okay, this is going to work. We should really do this for real. I should say that who actually did this was Ken, a postdoc in lab, who's great. So we decided to recruit people from the broader community, which I think is fortunate. I think it's why I'm speaking here. We put this rudimentary website together, Brain GPT. Based on one tweet, we have upwards of 1,400 people that have signed up and a lot of them willing to volunteer their time, as you'll see, to help us out. So there's a real community excitement about this and people really want this to happen and want to use it. So I think everybody feels this sense of being overwhelmed and that this would help them do their job better. And so we thought next thing to do was make a benchmark. So when we develop this model further or competitors develop theirs, we could see really, are these models actually getting the job done? So benchmarks have been really important in machine learning and developing models. So you've probably heard of the ImageNet benchmark that was really important in basically launching deep learning revolution with Alex for object recognition. 
And so we wanted to make something like that, but for neuroscience. And so the thing I came up with was to take neuroscience abstracts that the model wasn't trained on and take the original one and create a second version that was altered, that was coherent, that had the wrong result in it. For example, the original abstract here, I'll just read a snippet. Emotions recognition centered on ventral and medial parts of the prefrontal cortex. So that's the correct version, whereas the incorrect altered version would be emotions recognition centered on the dorsal and lateral parts of the prefrontal cortex. But I mean, they don't, they both sound fine, but, and they're both equal frequency and all that, but one's just a different finding. So we want to see how well can models like brain GPT and human experts get these kinds of questions. And so right now what we're doing is I got a team of volunteers, a bunch of humans that are making tons of test cases like this. And we're focusing on the Journal of Neuroscience, which is the standard journal in the field for 2023 articles. And that journal has five seconds, which is nice because now our benchmark could have five components to it. So things like behavioral, cognitive, cellular, molecular, these are all on the very different topics because neuroscience is vast. And so we want to test humans and machines on these cases that have an objectively correct answer for our benchmark. So unbeknownst to the volunteers, I realized that GPT-4, while it might not actually be able to solve these questions very accurately, at least we have it the Reddit through the benchmark when we're done, it could actually generate test cases for us. So I gave GPT-4 the same instructions and two examples that I gave the human volunteers, and it could generate abstracts just fine, it seems. So that's going to add a nice twist to the benchmark because we'll have basically human-created computer created test cases and we'll evaluate them both on human experts and machine systems. And of course we have a nice population of experts because many of these near 1400 people that have signed up are neuroscientists, excuse me. So we have a built-in group to test on to get a human comparison for this benchmark. Okay. So we want to do more than just take off the shelf things. We also want to change these models and make them more suitable to this application. So one thing we need for making predictions from these models is a sense of uncertainty or confidence. And I was surprised to learn that these large language models are fairly well calibrated when it comes to judging their own performance. They could be asked, are you sure you're right at this? They're decently calibrated, but I'd like to make them even more calibrated and train them to attach probabilities to statements because they'll mostly be scientists and people that understand probability. So could deal with that instead of hedge words like maybe, likely, and so forth. The natural language just attach probabilities and do some tuning to encourage the model to be well calibrated. So we'll do things like calculate meta D prime. So you might know D prime from signal detection theory is a measure of discrimination. So meta D prime captures how well calibrated someone's sense of confidence is in their judgments. And I, I think it's exciting because it seems like this is something you would need like some kind of Bayesian or probabilistic model to do, but it looks like these neural network models will be able to do this. In addition to being a tool for neuroscience, it could also tell us something about the structure of the field. So for example, when we look at what's the best training set, the best training collection from the model, that will say a lot about neuroscience as a field. So for example, does including review papers help or hurt the model's objective performance on our benchmarks? So review papers do not contain new empirical findings. They contain the author's opinion on which empirical papers are interesting. But does that just insert human bias into the model or does it help? I, I suspect it will help in cases where there's not a lot of empirical findings or training data. So in that case, the human expert might be like a useful prior, whereas in other domains where there's a lot of findings, many neglected, maybe the review paper will just add kind of bias to the model and not help. Of course, we could look at all kinds of other things, like should we weight training samples by how recently the paper was published, the impact factor, the journal it was published in, how many times it's been cited. So maybe we'll get funny findings like we'd train without nature and science papers, the system objectively works better or something, but it'll be interesting to see how it plays out as well as does it help to train on neighboring fields? So there might be like, does that help structure the model or, or not? So I think we'll learn something about neuroscience as a field from just trying to make brain GPT work better. As will we learn something about the field 
by how we elicit knowledge from it. So you might have come across people doing this step-by-step reasoning, show your work approach with large language models. So if you have the model, say, break down this problem step-by-step, explain each step, that could help in reasoning and certain mathematical tasks. So if neuroscience almost has a kind of logical structure to it, where it's like this, which caused this, and then this happened, then this kind of elicitation of knowledge in the model should help. But if it's more like what I suspect it is, this big morass of interconnected information that's tangled up and noisy, and it's almost like a information fusion problem, then it should help. But I guess we'll know once we do the work. Of course, everything I've said so far is not really specific to neuroscience. So we really want to create a template that's general that other fields could use. For example, this could be used, same approach could be used in chemistry and biology, not just for science either, really. I think any knowledge intensive endeavor, this kind of approach could be useful, including taking these machine learning models and maybe making sense of the machine learning literature with them. So that's one meta goal of this project. Um, in terms of partnerships, that are going to be really key to this succeeding. So already we're really relying on the the Brain GPT org website. Some people have reached out. I mean, it's great to be here today. For example, this Catalyst Neuro company that makes tools for analysis in neuroscience reached out and had some really helpful suggestions and had some interesting discussions with them. So you know, I welcome that kind of interaction with industry folks. And of course, we're very hungry for resources to make this happen. So. The last few weeks, I've written several grants, and that's a slow process, but so we're always on the look for resources, computationally, but also to hire more people to work on this full-time. So, of course, I'm up for whatever model gets this done as quickly as possible. Information overload is real, and it's definitely real for scientists. They just can't keep up and integrate all the information. And so the idea that I'm pitching is to draw on the strengths of large language models namely their ability to integrate information and draw samples from it, such as predicting what will happen in a study design, and avoid their weaknesses, which to me is just reporting factual information, because I don't really think that's what a generative model is designed to do. Uh, this is going to be a human-machine partnership as opposed to replacing people. This is going to frame GPT would be something they could interact with to overcome human limitations in terms of information processing. And now's the time really to do this, because even a few years ago, it might have not been possible, but there's all these enabling advances in this large language model space that make it possible to do brain GPT without burning through millions. It's possible to do it in an open source academic setting. Uh, so beyond tool use, like I just said, brain GPT might reveal the structure of the field by what works and what doesn't work according to benchmarks. And again, like I just said, the approach is general purpose. So this doesn't just have to be for neuroscience. I'm specializing in that because that's what I know in the community I could gauge with, but we want to create software tools that, and insights that could be applied broadly. And again, for that to happen, community involvement and partnerships will be key. Um, so I should just stop there and thank you and take any questions that you have. Wow, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was really My pleasure. Quite- Quite the rabbit hole. I, I had no idea just how far you've gotten, I think, and how much of a time that it could be before the call. So I'm really delighted that you join us. Thank you. Are you ready for some questions? Because we already oh, have. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. But it's also a reminder that in case you do want to ask a question, you're in the audience, feel free to either raise your hand or drop it here in the chat. And we already have a queue going, and I'll just loop you in. Randall, you're first, and you've had not one, but plenty of different questions. So let's maybe start with one. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I have more questions than it even shows because it turns out that I was sending some of them in the end as a direct message to one of the participants, which is a problem that I really don't like about Zoom, which is that it just automatically switches where you're sending chats to, and it's very hard to keep track of that. But anyway, that aside, I think that one of the things, okay, let me see. There are two things that I was very interested in. So first of all, you mentioned the problem confabulated or hallucinated results. And this is something that we definitely see with ChatGPT. And I don't know if this is a problem with all of the GPT models or large language models in general, because I'm just not an expert in that AI. But is this something that one could prevent somehow? Could one add a test to make sure that the knowledge being presented is real knowledge, that this isn't a confabulated story naively to someone who isn't an AI expert? That seems like something that one could do. And also, are you working with someone 
in the A and LM field to try to figure this out? Oh yeah, yeah. So first, yeah, I do have a uh, good collab, two good collaborators, Adrian Weller and Pasquale Minervi, that work in large language models that are listed on the Bridge GBT. Uh, website. But so far what we're doing, it's been nice. There's just so many tools right now, like through Hugging Face and that we're actually been so far being able to do everything I did just in my own lab. But later on, when we try to attack these, tackle these more advanced topics, like you mentioned, we'll definitely be happy to have those collaborators in hand. To answer your question though, like how do you solve this confabulation? So I think one of the most, or hallucination as people call it, I think one of the most effective ways I've seen is not relying on a model alone, but pairing it with a retrieval system or some kind of knowledge graph that has actual facts stored in it. So I don't really think these neural networks are sort of like neural implicit facts or knowledge. You can't really rely on it. Just like you can't really rely on your own memory. You go verify something on a scholarly article or some facts in Wikipedia or so forth. You don't just trust your memory in most cases if it's important. So yes, yeah, so you could hook these models up to like a huge knowledge base and you could basically that there's so many ways of doing this, but the standard idea would be every time you want to assert something, you'd have to find the actual real true citation to support what you're saying in the base knowledge base. But to back up further, this negative quality of these large language models, for me, it's actually a feature. It's not a bug because I don't, I'm not focusing on retrieval of information or facts. So if you took a published paper and you put its methods into this brain GPT and it generated a different pattern of results in that paper, that actually might mean that paper won't replicate if you rerun the experiment. Like it's not necessarily, this isn't about facts, this is about sort of more looking forward to what would happen if we did this based on what we know. So I think this is a real major issue that you highlighted for like if you're going to write a news article or a a review paper for a field where it has to be factual and you need real citations that are appropriately cited. Uh, that's a real hard problem. But for us, we actually want the generative model to, it's not hallucination for us, it's generalization. So it's, it's actually a positive quality. So we're just kind of spinning it around by changing the use case. So we actually don't have to fix this problem because it's actually a good attribute for us. Yeah. Well, do you know the bit on cyber? Cyborgism, you know, the last one series on cyborgism. And it's basically saying that hallucinations are just a competitive advantage of the AI to think in different ways than we can think. And rather than trying to align it exactly with the way that humans think, we should like use that creative power um, in a different way to kind of help us where we may be off and just have kind of like a different mind that we can collaborate with. Anyway, that's a whole No, that could totally be true. Issue. Yeah, they just one last thing. Of course, you're gonna have a, a, an objective benchmark that's been held out. So we could see if these like hallucinatory behaviors, is it like basically aligned with reality or not? Like you say, it might be different ways of looking at things more creative in some cases, but we can actually see, is it just off the wall or is it actually beating humans at predicting outcomes? So we have a nice, I think it's important too, what you said, I totally agree with, it's also nice to have an objective measure of how like aligned with reality the model is. Yeah. That would be ideal. Yeah, especially in science. Um, yes. Okay, thanks for that. We have Linda who had her hand up for a while. My question relatively simple. That is, until Brain GPT is up or more available, have you found it helpful? I know I have to do this because I'm more interdisciplinary too. I actually have to go to several different AIs just to verify. And there must be a way to do that computationally. But how have you done that? Is that part of your plan? Does it help? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it's a really interesting idea or suggestion to one thing we should do or we propose to do in all these grant proposals is to look at more than one base or foundational model pooling across them. But that's, I mean, that's a good idea. That might be a way to do some kind of verification, though. I wonder if they could all confabulate in similar ways if they're trained on similar like databases and whatnot. So I think what is really needed, I mean, I think the models for how you're using them are just letting you down right now. And they should link in their reply to the sources, like for some authoritarian source, either like a scientific article or a news article, maybe if that's still trustworthy or, and it hasn't been written all by computers you know, or Wikipedia or something. So I think that's going to be, again, this is in the area I'm working on, but I think that's going to be 
the future that you could actually use it, how you're using it and trust it. Cause right now it's not really a good use of your time to go through all these things. And that's not even guaranteed because they could all be wrong in the same way. So I think we're just stuck now. You could basically use the models for inspiration for how you're discussing them or for good ideas, but then you have to confirm pretty much everything they say is what it says. And I don't think, unfortunately, there's a way around it right now. And that's why like Meta had to pull down their galactic model because it wasn't summarizing things correctly. And I, without the link to the, some kind of database, there's just really, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I just don't think there's a way to solve it because it's like a generative model. It's, it, it's trying to link things together. That's what makes it so cool that it could write novel computer code and it could be creative. It could write poems in different styles. And so it's just not regurgitating. It's just not a parrot, a uh, stochastic parrot as the title of the paper, could just like this model. So it's just not that. And so the downside of that is it's just going to make stuff up. I mean, because it's going to generalize what it's been trained on and, and give you samples from its trained on instead of exactly what it was trained on. Yes, yeah, so I'll just the guy, stop there, but yeah. No, that's okay. I just wanted to let you know the guy, Nicholas Tulane, is his name, okay. who developed Ask Sage. His, he swears, you know, that his is trained on a different database and so doesn't produce hallucinations until, I can't prove otherwise, but I thought it was an interesting claim. So thank you. No, I just, I, no, thank you. It was a really good question. I just, yeah, I, I should look follow up on your pointer, but I just think you want these things to generalize. So that in a sense, I mean, we call it connecting the dots and generalization when it's right. We call it hallucination when it's wrong. So I just think these are like two sides of the same coin. And it, I don't think you could have a flexible system that doesn't get it wrong sometimes, just like how humans do as well. But humans, we make them show their work, which is like a protocol now with these models or site things to prove their case. I guess we're just going to have to do this, prove their work, cite things. Yeah. There is, for example, Illicit, which I don't know how many people here are using, but Illicit is pretty accurate. Like it lists, basically like it, it summarizes a bunch of abstracts. It lists those that are most relevant to you, makes them relevant for the specific question that you have. And it's like basically like an AI research assistant that I think ought, uh, I'm posting it here. It looks like this. Yeah. And you can sign up and it's from like an AI safety lab in the Bay. And it's pretty good. Like it's really accurate, cool. but it's, it doesn't give you like an exact answer to the question that you have, but it gives you like specific papers that are relevant and summarizes their abstracts in a way that is relevant to a question. So you still have to do a little bit more work. Okay. We have, still have so many questions to go through. Next one up with Nicola. Thank you. Very exciting talk. Just a small comment to Linda's question, something that I've noticed it's just by design. Those models, they have a very small contextual memory. And therefore, the prompt that you ask determines a lot the way the model will answer. So you may go across different AIs and they will be confirming the bias of your question, especially for very specific questions. But my question is, if you listen to Jan Likun, he's speaking about how the current models have zero knowledge about the physical world, zero common sense, and that's a problem. And you, in your endeavor, actually, I think it's a, maybe a great place to add some knowledge about the physical world. The example that you gave with the medial versus lateral, the dorsal versus ventral prefrontal cortex. So when you have the multidimensional matrix with the weights, and you add the different modules, you can actually devise a physics module, which will generate a spatial positioning of information, a little bit like Google was doing with the word clouds in the beginning. Uh -huh. And so you can latch the information that you're having with respect to whether it's information about medial versus dorsal and have a distance measure so that it can relatively position the knowledge for the brain. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. I mean, so I think, I, first, I think you're right that if you build in sort of more of that grounding knowledge, it would help. But I guess I'm surprised that these models, maybe I'm just not as negative as looking on it, because I think I remember someone doing this little study with models asking, you know, how far apart are these cities and so forth, like Paris, London, the whole world, and getting like a pretty decent like map from it, because it's just there, I guess, I, I don't know that it is somehow like implicitly in there, but, or in my case, it might actually just have a table of like flight distances or something, 
But, but yeah, I think you're right. There's room for all kinds of modules. I mean, people want to put in basically like Python interpreters to run code or simulations in it. But yeah, I think having some sense of some physical grounding could help a lot, like, especially as you mentioned with having some idea of the volume in the brain and where is next to what and how do things connect. So, I mean, I think there's some hope of getting that through language alone, but I mean, why not try what you're saying, adding additional constraints or modules to it and just seeing how it plays out. But I think for some of these projects, seeing it as really a long-term project, like one of these grants we applied for is like eight years. So that's something that we probably wouldn't do right away. We'd probably just try to get something off the ground and working and useful and get it in people's hands. But there's other topics too we want to tackle right away, like uncertainty. But yeah, I mean, looking at topics like you mentioned is like on the list of advanced topics. That's a really... Cool. Next one up. I can also ask you. He says, I did didn't understand how the current approach helps, for example, brain GPT do new science. How do you create new hypothesis tests, etc.? How does the current framework do it, or will we need a new architecture, or maybe a chain of models to work together with math or something that doesn't require real life experience? But this seems much more tractable. Yeah, no, these are all really good questions. I mean, I think the creativity here is going to come from the human partner. So the way I'm seeing this is that someone's designing, and I think this is what got the neuroscientists excited because most of them aren't modelers. They want to type in the experiment they have in mind and have this thing, brain GPT, say what it thinks is going to happen based on every paper that's previously been published. And so this could be a way to basically just work through one's intuitions, figure out how to tweak the design to make it maybe more high power, more and more likely to get the result that you're aiming for. Yeah, I mean, I can see really just using it to be interesting if there's been this experiment on this species or this population, how would it look if I run it on this other one? And like I said, you could use this too to really, when you think the field's got something systematically wrong because of some errors making, you could basically verify that by putting in the, the idea you have and seeing that the brain GPT makes the exact opposite prediction you do. Or conversely, you could put in something and see it with 99% certainty that's consistent with everything else that's been done. So maybe if you're thinking about running experiments, like in terms of almost like an active learning framework to try to like reduce uncertainty about like how the brain works, then maybe you should run that study because we already probably know the answer of uh, certainty. So a way I would use it personally is I'd make models of uh, human and animal learning. And I would, right now I, I fit specific studies so I try to get the data patterns, but I could actually just put in like studies that don't exist into brain GPT and get its projection of based on the field's entire understanding, all the papers about what should happen. So in some ways I could test out my model, like against almost like an integration of all the findings in the field and see is it generally consistent with the larger literature. And you can do that kind of instant meta-analysis of the model. So I think it's really like a tool mostly to help people design their studies and see how the measures, populations work out and see maybe how surprising their prediction is relative to the field's current knowledge. I'm sure once it's out there, people will use it for other ways, but that's just the way we've been pitching it. So I think their question was really good, but it was sort of implying, what should we do next? I think do that kind of Maybe what you could do is have to do some kind of automated search. Something in the human right now is doing a search, but maybe you could do some kind of automated search, like almost some kind of like active learning where you're like, okay, what would be the optimal study to run to reduce brain GPT's uncertainty in this area? So you could actually use it if you had a different like search system running on top to try to figure out like where the unresolved questions are. So that could be a good heuristic to where you should run experiments if you're thinking of it and sort of like uncertainty minimization. But yeah, it alone wouldn't do that. So right now I'm thinking the human does that. But I think as your question implies, you could have something doing some kind of search over it to see what would be, where the areas that really need further empirical exploration. Very cool. Thank you. And next one up we have. Thank you. A really awesome presentation. We've been working in kind of a similar direction, I think. And like our approach was to take the tech tree and have that basically be like this domain knowledge layer to use to then query knowledge APIs. And I think like that roadmap is really there. So it'd be great to, yeah, work together. And I think see how we can combine forces. Yeah, no, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I was mentioning, I think a lot of the shortcomings that like Linda and others are highlighting 
is from not doing exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be great to talk more. Cool. Yeah. Cause also just like really quickly, we've been looking at what's happening with like software, like meta GPT or GPT engineer. And there's so many parallels I think we can bring into science. For example, make roadmaps for experiments, roadmaps for what's the line of research that could be most impactful in a specific area. So awesome work. Looking forward to the future. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the feedback and the pointers. I look forward to talking more. Now we only have five more questions or something from Randall. Oh, Randall, you want to meet? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put a whole bunch of questions up there. In fact, I would say that the only really relevant question I have remaining is something about using large language models in a very different way than what you've described. And I asked this because some colleagues of mine have suggested that one could use it as a way to understand, for example, aspects of the connectome of the brain and how it relates to function of the brain. So using a large language model to fill in data or to try to generate functional models based on connectome data from the brain. And I don't know if this is something that you've thought about, if this in some way connects to your thinking about the use of large language models in neuroscience. But anyway, if you have any thoughts about that, I'd be very interested. Oh, I mean, but my only real thought is like, yeah, I mean, I'd love a pointer to what your colleagues are doing if they have anything in shareable form. Because yeah, it seems, it seems like they're, I mean, in some ways it seems like what they're doing is very similar and more directed to the topic, whereas we're just basically getting to throw the kitchen sink of the neuroscience literature at this and try to go for broad coverage of all areas. But yeah, it seems like a really, yeah, yeah it basically it just it sounds allied and interesting and maybe just a bit more focused. Yeah. Cool. Well, and do you want to add anything else or are you good? I take that as you, that is good. I always, yeah. always have a question that I ask people at the end of this, which is sure. that if people are excited about your work, and yeah, I think you could tell that they are. Then what's something that people here in this group or like beyond like people that watch this on YouTube afterwards can do to actually help you work forward? And I know that you already showed the form where people can apply or something, but if there are any specific collaborations you want to highlight, and I know that, I mean, funding's always useful. So feel free to make that plug again. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. the famous plug moment here, but yeah, anything that's useful for people to take away as an action item would be. Well, this is, that's very kind of you to give this forum an opportunity. Yeah, I wish I had something more prepared, but just like you said, if people are interested in just getting news or participating, this braingpt.org website, they could just easily sign up and we don't spam people. I don't even think we've mailed the mailing list yet, but, but yeah, also in terms of, I mean, people should also feel free to contact me directly on potential collaborations and definitely if anybody is interested, I mean, we're really, really like in research, resource search mode now too. So of course, like any partnerships along those lines would be really welcomed. I mean, everyone seems really excited within science. So hopefully we get the resources we need to do this, but it could be a slow process, jump charge it. So like right now it's really all these people helping us is making it go faster. But yes. so, yeah, so I guess basically I just repeated exactly what you said with adding people should feel free to get directly in touch too on collaborative ideas. Yeah. Are you guys a nonprofit or are you oh, are like as a, just, are you guys a nonprofit? Are you operating as an open source? Oh program? yeah. No, it's just, I'm just operating out of my university, UCL. So we have no, it's actually a good idea to consider. We have not created any sort of like official organization or anything, but that would be, that's something that could happen if, if there is, yeah, if there are opportunities where that makes sense and maybe something should happen anyway, like pretty soon, uh, because I'm not used to doing projects like this where you just get so many people that are interested and willing to contribute. So in the past, it's not really relevant because if you're working with four other scientists, you don't need to form an organization. But I think what you just said is something, this is a really another reason why I'm happy to be invited here because that's really actually good, um, a good idea because with so many people, it, it probably makes sense to formalize things more. Right now, everything's going great. But, well yeah. Looking down the line and looking towards trying to secure resources, it probably would make sense. Yeah. 
Well, I'm just, we're a nonprofit and have been for, well, 38 years and it helps to have tax exempt donations. Helps a lot. <laughs> and maybe accepting crypto or something. I don't know, but that helped us a lot. Yeah. Too, I'm sure. No, it's, anyway. yeah, it's a really good idea. Yeah. Right now it's possible through the university to do that as it's a nonprofit, but it might make sense to, since it's broader to set something up, but I'll definitely give that some thought. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well. Thank you so much for coming. This was really interesting, much more interesting than I had, had even hoped for when I had contacted you in the first place. And I think it's really awesome. I think we will definitely see that across many other fields now, right? Like it can be a perfect yeah. template solution that you can just like pretty much like copy paste and edit a bit. This was really great. Thanks a ton. Thanks a lot for taking time. Thanks everyone for your great question.